instruct uh, operators to collect the data, mm -hmm. to retain data. Yeah. And then at the same time we are saying it shouldn't be collected. So you have this, uh, this tension there. Um, but big data is, without making the, the whole discussion too long, uh, big data is two things, if I'm not mistaken. It's the fact that there is a collection of vast amounts of data, but that in correlation, the capacity to treat and data mine this vast amount of data has grown exactly in proportion. So it's now the combination of the both. Because if you have a huge amount of data and you need 20 million people to actually sift manually through the little small paper cards, you can have as much data as you want. It produces the STASI, i.e. Uh, an inability to actually uh, <laughs> exploit the amount of data you collect. The challenge is that today we have this massive collection, not for data retention, but because people are voluntarily giving a, a lot of data as well, and the capacity to treat it. So it's the connection of the two, isn't it? Yes, absolutely, and uh, <coughs> that's uh, in, the, in the Council of Europe context, we have a multiple treatment of that as well. Mm. Uh, so, uh, for example, in, in July, the Committee of Ministers adopted a declaration on surveillance and tracking. We go back to the, to the 70s, and there are cases in the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. The, the court can uh, hold to account uh, uh, member states for their performance in respect of the of the respect of human rights uh, mm -hmm. of individuals uh, across Europe. So you have cases like class, which is precisely about mass surveillance. Mm -hmm. It says mass surveillance, that there may be an interest in the security of the state and so on, but uh, it can be used against democracy. It can end up undermining democracy under the appearance of wanting to, uh, to safeguard it. Mm -hmm. If you apply that, <coughs> you, you have consequences. The, FRA, the the secret service and surveillance law in Sweden is pending before the court now. Mm. So you have the equivalent of uh, PRISM, maybe not with the, with the data accumulation, but, uh, but uh, in respect of the surveillance aspect of cross-border mm. communication uh, in Sweden, that is pending before the court. You, you have all these things that are, that are happening and, uh, and it shows the different interests the different players. The court is there. As mm. a, it, it, the court will take decisions years after the events, but it will signal what is the yeah. human rights take Set of on a particular issue. Set and, of and then you have the, the intergovernmental, you have 47 states that say surveillance and tracking is a risk. And uh, they mm. at an intergovernmental level, they signal the, the risk and the alarm, and they say, beware of this. This can engage your own responsibility mm from a human rights perspective. It would be great if, if it did. <laughs> uh, it would be great. Uh, who else has a, a comment? Yes? No, 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 a presentation. Um. Contribution. Thanks, so I'm Stuart Hamilton. I'm from the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, or IFLA. And tomorrow morning we have a workshop, um, workshop 166 in room 6, uh, internet copyright policy, uh, multi-stakeholder or multilateral. And the premise for this workshop is extremely simple. Uh, it's really a debate about whether or not uh, internet policy or copyright policy for the internet should be developed in a new multi-stakeholder forum or whether the existing multilateral status quo is enough. And the kind of impetus for this workshop came up from all sorts of things really ongoing. Um, the inclusion of IP in international trade agreements where civil society doesn't get a chance to look at ongoing drafts, um, the work that IFLA is heavily involved in at WIPO regarding copyright exceptions and limitations, mm -hmm. and the purpose of the session really is to explore the question that's in the title and to let the audience have a say about where they think this debate should go. Depending on the, on the outcome, and I, I sense, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, I sense an underlying trend in the workshop that goes to saying it should be probably a little bit more multi-stakeholder. Perhaps. <laughs> so, provided that this is validated by the workshop and that people do say that is the case, what do you envisage as the next step? What would be the outcome, not on paper declaration or so, but in terms of action, how would IFLA 
carry forward the message that it would be given on that occasion? Well, I'm not sure that IFLA will be able to, uh, to tran transition um, the entire international copyright frameworks from its existing status quo. However, um, we're about to undertake um, negotiations regarding the North America EU trade agreement uh -huh. uh, at the moment. Mm. And, of course, the modalities for engagement in that are still uh, perhaps a little less vague than they are for the, for the, the Trans-Pacific Agreement. So I think there is a movement within Europe to, a, to at least uh, get civil society voices, more multi-stakeholder voices involved in those negotiations as they progress. So I think that the outcome of this workshop at least could contribute to that debate uh, and could uh, provide some background materials or, or even input as that moves forward. Okay, that's important. Uh, bridging a substantive topic with a procedural issue, which is uh, interesting always. Um, any other um, organizer or person would like, yes. Thank you. I'm Louise Bennett from the BCS, uh, but I'm not actually going to talk about the same uh, workshop that Andy was talking about. Um, we helped also with the development of workshop 55, 11 o'clock on day three, um, which is uh, part of the youth IGF, um, and it's run by ChildNet and the Safer Internet Project. And one of the things I think you'll find very interesting if you attend this is that they've produced um, uh, a, a, the results of a survey of a large number of young people on their views of anonymity on the internet uh, it related both to child protection um, and to online bullying, which is a, a problem on uh, social networks as far as young people are concerned. So I thought, if there was no one else from ChildNet here, I would just mention that workshop. Thank you. It's, uh, it, it, it's great you mentioned this. I'll come back to it. Oops. Any other... Uh, Jovan Diplo is doing workshops, uh, aren't you? Not to put you on the spot and un un unguarded, but... <laughs> Already done. <laughs> well, that's a good uh, caveat. <laughs> As always from Beltran. Uh, well, I think Vlada, Vlada is, uh, has been organizing the workshop, but okay. probably one workshop, since you mentioned data mining, could be uh, relevant or its flash session. Uh, we're oh, yeah, there are flash sessions. We are That's presenting yeah. uh, findings of the research on language on, of the IGF since 2006. Mm -hmm. Basically, what we did, we ran the, collected the transcripts, which are available online, and processed them and uh, tried to look for the paternity and also level of participation and to get some sort of evidence-based support for the multi-stakeholderism to see in the reality how many government representatives uh, mm. intervened during the last six or seven years, and uh, also combining it with the region, with gender issues. That's and there are some interesting insights in that. And I think it is on Thursday, if I'm correct. Uh, Thursday afternoon. Okay. And then the remote participation standards. Sure. No, but there will be, it's, a, it's an interesting segue to another thing I wanted to, to raise, so I'm glad I asked you. Is there any other... Uh, organizer or or even if you've been co-organizing or participating or, or you've gone a speaker in, in one workshop, don't hesitate to mention it if it's relevant. Well, it's more polite to come up in the front. <laughs> uh, apologies for being late, but I was just in time to present the workshop. Uh, I'm Wim de Huzelo working for Center, which is the European CCTLD organization. And we organize um, uh, Tuesday, um, Wednesday uh, morning a uh, workshop on the social role of CCTLDs. Uh, it's a workshop we organize together with the other reg regional organizations. Uh, there are for each region, I mean for um, Latin America it's LEC TLD, for Africa AVE TLD, uh, for Asia Pacific it's AP TLD, a regional TLD, CCTLD organization. And together, I think we have been organizing for the every IGF meeting except the first one, uh, workshops together, where we presented and gave an explanation on what CCTLDs are, what they are doing. And in the past, it was really focusing on what are we doing, uh, how is the domain name system working, what problems there are, 
uh, we focused one year a little bit more on uh, new developments like um, IDNs. Uh, but this year, uh, we want to choose, I think, a little bit um, um, strange title for a lot of our members, talking about the social role of a CCTLD. What we want to do is, okay, we explained the previous years um, what we do, our strict work making the domain name system work and making the national CCTLD work. But we know from our members, the registries, they do a lot more. Uh, they invest in uh, programs, in uh, capacity building programs. Um, they invest in, in programs for school children. And that's our ways um, in which they take also responsibility for the uh, local internet community they uh, represent and for which um, they uh, run the CCTLD. Uh, if you look uh, on the agenda of the, uh, of the workshop, you will see we will have examples from each of the regions. We will have the Russians uh, talking about, uh, the Russian registry talking about the platform they have uh, on the internet. Uh, we will have um, an African example on uh, how they use a multi-stakeholder model to, um, to run the uh, national, um, uh, national infrastructure. Uh, also, other examples from the Czech Republic where they use really invest in uh, um, what they basically do in uh, this is they buy time in, um, during the normal TV commercials and they present during uh, 30 seconds um, on how on a typical, typically problem or a danger on the internet. And they say, okay, this is really popular, and that are the kind of, of topics of, of examples we want to give uh, it this time. So I would like to invite you all. It's on Wednesday morning, uh, the first block. Pim, one, one question that you, uh, one point that you didn't uh, mention, but that uh, Byron Holland from Sierra was now the chair of the uh, uh, Country Code uh, Supporting Organization in ICANN, had mentioned in one interaction it turns out that when you look at the map of the national IGFs, the CCTLDs have often played a very strong role in facilitating, organizing, funding sometimes, not always, but often. Um, is that something that you're going to, uh, to address? Is, is it something that you would see um, as a natural outcome of the interactions that the, uh, the CCs have with the community of people participating in the IGF, like growing this better cooperation, and you see them basically having a strong role in growing the network of national IGFs? Um, well, it is, it is uh, linked, and I would say it is another example, next to the examples we will give during the workshop, uh, that basically in, in a lot of countries, if you talk about the, uh, the IGF, or if somebody is talking on the, in the country about uh, IGF or internet governments is often the CCTLD registry yeah. because the other people, they don't know or they don't care. Uh, because it's, a, it's an, uh, an important element. Okay, thank you. Um, any other uh, comment or, or presentation? If that's not the case, um, I actually was, was listening to, to what... Um, yes, Paul. Should we also present uh, the workshop that we're organizing? We're organizing a workshop? <laughs> I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, it's a good idea. Go ahead. So you are Paul Fellinger, and you want to present a workshop on... <laughs> um, yes, hello. Um, <laughs> You're right. <laughs> so we are organizing workshop um, 42, which will take place tomorrow at 11 o'clock in room 1, which is Nusadua Hall 2. Um, the workshop is called Fair Process Frameworks for Cross-Border Online Spaces. Um, a quick description of what we are. So the Internet and Jurisdiction Project is a global multi-stakeholder dialogue process, which means it's a process between international organizations, states, platforms, operators, and users on how to address the tension between the cross-border nature um, of the Internet and geographically defined national jurisdictions. Um, so the question of how to handle the digital coexistence of heterogeneous normative orders in shared transnational cross-border online spaces is, of course, directly at the focus of what we are trying to do. Um, 
And um, tomorrow we will have um, a very interesting workshop with great speakers and participants of the global preparatory process um, that preceded the workshop tomorrow. We had meetings in four different regions. Um, we started with a meeting in Rio de Janeiro. The second one was in Paris for the European region. And the one in Rio um, was for Brazil and the Latin American region. Then we had um, a meeting in New Delhi for India and uh, just two weeks ago um, in Washington um, for North America. So, um, Go ahead. <laughs> um, I would really love you to, to attend the session. I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion. Um, there are brochures in, um, who should be distributed in all the tote bags that you received. Um, it's the Internet and Jurisdiction White Paper, um, which looks like that. And basically, as a preliminary outcome of this ongoing global multi-stakeholder dialogue process, um, we identified um, three areas for cooperation and six potential building blocks for um, the elaboration or the, the exploration of a potential elaboration of fair process frameworks between states, platforms, users, um, and operators. So I'm really looking forward um, to you attending the session. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it's indeed one, one of the reasons why we wanted to, uh, to organize this, uh, this pre-event is because we are addressing in the Internet and Jurisdiction Project a lot of the issues that you are addressing but from another um, angle somehow, which is a procedural angle, uh, basically to identify how to develop procedural interfaces and modes of interaction between actors who normally do not interact directly, and particularly um, law enforcement and governments versus platforms and Internet operators in another country, because today you normally go through uh, an intergovernmental process to uh, organize this interaction. So without getting into too much, too much detail, I saw that a few people have arrived and um, maybe uh, if they want to make a, a comment or a presentation, we were just finishing uh, the, the round. If, if you want, Henriette or anybody want to make a presentation on their workshops, uh, please, please raise your hand. What I wanted to, to, to do now, following the comments that have been, that have been made, is I saw a few threads or a few, a few tracks that would be uh, maybe interesting to, to explore further. One is clearly that there has been a certain number of presentations regarding facets of privacy. It can be regional facets. I mean, unfortunately, our friend from Malaysia has left, but um, it's facets of privacy in different regions. It's uh, anonymity. It's uh, the youth angle. Um, but I would like to make the connection uh, also in a certain way with the, uh, the issue of, of big data. And one of the purposes of this, uh, of, of this meeting is not only to look at where the workshops are taking place, but to see whether there are links between themes that are not supposed to be under the same heading but that actually have connections because the whole debate about privacy is indeed connected to uh, the debate of the growth of big data tools. And so one of the things I wanted to, to, to highlight first is to encourage maybe here or, or later on the people who organize the different workshops to, to connect and interact and see how they can build upon the work that the others are doing. Like, if you are organizing a workshop on privacy or one angle of privacy, look at the ones that are presented on related topics to see whether you can benefit from having one of their speakers come to your workshop and you going to theirs so that there is a cross-fertilization between the two. I would actually say that the same applies to the a second track that I sensed which was connecting somehow the, um, the issue of, of cloud, cross-border services, underlying infrastructure, and the lowering the barriers to entry for innovation and so on, and in a certain way, the question on universality that Yanis um, was, was mentioning. 
Because the question of whether the services are available, when we say the Internet, the Internet is not only the accessibility to the plug somehow, it's also the accessibility to the services that are on the Internet that become a part of the infrastructure. So that's, that's a, second, uh, a second track. The third one was actually less present, but it's, it's just an accident of who was able to come, is things that are related to uh, freedom of expression. And there was one that was mentioned regarding uh, uh, journalists and, and so on. But the track, the track of freedom of expression is one thing that I wanted to highlight as a, almost a third uh, angle uh, because it resonates with what we were highlighting in terms of digital coexistence. Freedom of expression is one of the areas where the coexistence of different norms is becoming harder and harder. And the difference and the diversity of cultural, religious, political sensitivities in a growing population of Internet users that are becoming more and more diverse is becoming an issue because they have references that are different. There are less and less frameworks that are common, and there are relatively few procedures to handle this, this coexistence among, among, um, among actors. Um, finally, and, and I'd like to, to encourage people to, to chime in uh, afterwards, there's one thing that we've not addressed so much and maybe I would like to revisit for the people who have presented, is how does the IGF take place for you in an ongoing process. For us, for instance, as Paul was mentioning, we started this project two years ago. We presented preliminary results at the uh, IGF in Baku last year, and we're doing again the presentation of what, is, what has happened this year. And next year, we'll start, the, uh, hopefully with the different participants, the drafting of an actual operational framework. For your activities, how does it fit to come to the IGF? What is the expected step that you hope to achieve? And how does it fit into a larger process? And in asking those two questions, i.e. tracks, and second, how does it fit into a process, I'm trying also to, to feed into the discussions that take place in the MAG on how to improve the IGF, how to make sure that Every year, there is more connection between the issues, more connection between the people who deal with similar issues so that the IGF is not a moment where we split, saying, oh, so bad, I would like to go to 20 workshops that are taking place at the same time, but there is a, a more coherent set of tracks, and second, it is more a part of ongoing processes so that the IGF uh, brings um, um, a sort of milestone every year in something that is that is evolving. Does anybody want to, to, to chime in? Uh, I would love to have people explaining whether it fits into an ongoing process, for instance. Yes, what you're saying very much chimes in with what we've found over the last three years, and particularly on the first trend that you were talking about, privacy, uh, anonymity, complying with big data. One of the things that we're looking at particularly this year is what we call identity discovery through the analysis of big data, uh, particularly... Uh, reverse engineering. Re in reverse server, engineering. Metadata analysis. Particularly, uh, um, in fact, while it has uh, um, a lot of, uh, lot of stuff is talked about it from the government point of view, we actually think it's much greater from the commercial point of view and it's the monetization of... Uh, of data attributes and uh, the, uh, the way that, uh, that that invades your privacy in a way that most internet users don't appreciate. They may not mind about it, but some mind and some don't mind. One question in that regard. In your workshop, um, what, what participants do you have from the business uh, side who are actually users of this big data to, to, to present the different facets of we've the problem? We've got uh, uh, Facebook, uh -huh. um, and we've got... Uh, yeah, but they're a minor player in this field. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 and uh, 
I myself am from the industry side, so uh, we, we, we're covering it from quite a number of point of views. And we're concerned, in fact, that one of the things that we see as a failure of the IGF is not to engage with business outside the IT businesses as effectively um, uh, as, as we think it should be, because that is where so much is going on. Hmm. Interesting. Is there, is there any, any comment in that regard? I see nodding, as we say. In no, I just think that's a really good point. <laughs> Um, maybe suggestions about how we can do that. I, I think it's a, a really um, critical point. I think it also would affect the nature of the debate um, if we have a wider variety of, of business entities here. When you're both talking about a wider variety of, of business entities, are you thinking about uh, companies like, for instance, insurance companies or, or what kind of companies are not in that sector and manipulate a lot of, of data? Because I think it's a very, very good point. I, I think insurance companies is a very good example, but banking. I also think retail, yeah. banking, ba retail. Um, energy companies, there are That's so many that are actually doing it, particularly with the development of the Internet of Things and smart cities. There's uh, an enormous amount that's happening in mm -hmm. sectors that are really not represented at the UNIGF. I'm, I'm, just, I'm not sure what type of company it is, but recently when I tried to have my mobile, mobile number removed from a database, um, which enabled me or, or ended up in me having a lot of, of um, spam, <laughs> and I actually discovered a company, and, and that's just what it does. Um, when any information that you've given on any form you filled in or any transaction is um, made available, um, even if it's anonymized, um, this company manipulates that data, organizes it, sorts it, and sells it to people. So I don't know what you call them, but that <laughs> certainly would be the type of company we'd want to have this conversation with. That's interesting. If, if, I, if I piggyback on, on, uh, on this on a methodological uh, point, how do we move forward from this idea, which is there is a category of actor that clearly needs to be engaged that are not participating in the IGF. The goal is not necessarily to have everybody come to the wonderful locations that we happen to go to every year. How do you do that? Uh, what can happen in between? Aisha. Aisha Hassan from the International Chamber of Commerce. I would just say that my colleague, uh, Barbara Weiner, is in the room as well from the U.S. Council for International Business. <laughs> and we work, she works at the national level and we work together at the international level to try to get the range of companies you're talking about to be aware of the fact that the Internet governance issues impact their business, their operations, that this is something that they need to care about. So we have an ongoing campaign uh, trying to get that message through to them. But I would be really pleased to work with others who either have contacts. It might be by starting to invite a particular person from a particular couple of companies or whatever to say, come share your experience on a particular issue. And mm -hmm. that would bring them in because of the, their own priorities as a company and the expertise that they have in managing the different challenges or issues that, that we're talking about. I have to say that, I mean, I've been doing this for many years and trying to bring in mm -hmm. business to the global level discussions on these issues. And it is broader already. The presence of business at the IGF is broader than IT companies. I mean, we really do have a broader range. But major users are a major next stage that we need to all work together to figure out how to, how to bring them in. Right, Barbara? <laughs> Yeah, so I'm saying that to all of you. I mean, it's an ongoing challenge, and we're here to work with you. Max, you wanted to, to chime in. Yes, please. <coughs> Max Eng is from uh, Google. I mean, as, um, you post this as a methodolog methodological <laughs> question almost. I mean, it's a question of representativeness, right? So um, most of us live in representative democracies, so um, the interests have to somehow be uh, collected and then represented on a higher level. So Aisha is a wonderful example. She represents 
a lot of the business interests, right? Everybody from the business side, which uh, makes it on the uh, one hand impossible to take very hard positions possibly because there are so many different actors she's representing. But on the other hand, if we had all the representatives from all the different industries here, it would be impossible to have a conversation. So we're really tackling one of the fundamental issues of multi-stakeholderism and this um, yeah, very open environment that we have that even an individual user can come in and represent himself. And how do we get a Habermasian um, solution to things if um, everybody can speak and how do we gather representativeness in that sense? I think it's a very good conversation to have. Sorry to come back in. I just wanted to say that um, in terms of the positions that my organization puts forward, there are many companies that have weighed in that never set foot at the IGF. So we do actually have users who weigh in on the positions that are developed, but they don't actually come. So what I'm saying is that maybe by targeting a few areas of expertise that we want, we can all work together in our networks to get those experts to come, and in turn those industry sectors would be uh, getting more engaged in the discussion. Actually, thanks, Max, for, for raising this, and I will, uh, unless there are uh, additional comments, I will close this specific uh, element. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very specifically on the question of, of uh, uh, other businesses uh, and other moments in the process, uh, we have in the Council of Europe rich experience in respect of that. Uh, we are revising the Data Protection Convention, for example, and there are different stakeholder groups that are represented there. The ICC, for example, is very active. Uh, we are dealing with uh, mm. uh, personal data and the police, and there we bring in other stakeholders, data protection mm. and uh, health care, and, uh, which, which uh, also relates to, to insurance uh, and health insurance related issues and so on. And we bring in other stakeholders in. In, in the area of cybercrime, for example, there is a, a, a big event that will take place at the beginning of uh, December, the Octopus Conference, mm -hmm. which brings in other stakeholders, other industries, other parts of, uh, of society that are interested in the issue. So, so I think that uh, it, would be, it would be false to think that uh, the, 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 multi, the scope of multi-stakeholderism uh, in uh, internet governance discussions uh, can be exemplified by the IGF. There is much more no, going on at different points in time uh, in between sessions and things that are discussed here are taken to those other uh, separate fora at different uh, stages of processes. No, th thanks, Jan. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's, that's what I like about that kind of, of, of meeting is that it goes in directions that I had not anticipated at all. But this is a very interesting uh, illustration. And, and thanks to Max for having, uh, for having raised this, because it is indeed a methodological question that I was raising. And the spontaneous answer that I would give is that in any multi-stakeholder process, the question is the relevant stakeholders. And what has happened here is that on the side of a discussion, a category of stakeholders, a, a subcategory of stakeholders, has been identified as being beneficial to bring into a discussion where they have probably interacted with only through the channels of an organization like ICC so far. And so what I, what I sensed here brings me to uh, two lessons, basically. One is that the, um, the exercise of identifying who the relevant stakeholders are for a specific topic is as much an openness issue as a proactive outreach. And yeah, let, let me make the second point and, and I'll, uh, we can continue. Um, so the only way the right scope of stakeholders uh, can emerge is if the discussion is going exactly the way we're, we're conducting it here, like in a sort of free form thing around this topic we want to focus on identity discovery. Ah, oh, identity discovery made us understand that there are actors who have data who are not the ones we're thinking about normally. How do we engage them and what is the process? And the second element is that I didn't know exactly what to expect from, from, from this session apart from the presentation of the different workshops. But to keep on the methodological track, 
I do think that there should be, in the IGFs, a few meetings like that around meta topics so that people can spend at the beginning or at the end, I don't mind, one hour saying, or two hours, on that specific issue. If you have been following workshops on privacy during the week, if you plan to organize a workshop on privacy during the week, having a, something at the beginning and something at the end is actually likely to facilitate the gathering of actors for the workshops on the next year, because then there will be no who to, to talk to and who to work with. You wanted to, to make a, a comment. Uh, yeah, it was basically on the, um, uh, what, you, what you were saying about relevant stakeholders. Um, I think in this whole discussion, um, a, a key point would be uh, the law of unintended consequences. Yes. Um, you say about relevant stakeholders, one of the things that I found and one of the things that we'll be discussing tomorrow, would, we don't sort of talk about big data, but more data aggregation. Um, and it's the ability to data mine uh, aggregated data sets. Yes. Um, so you've got lots of organizations that are doing things uh, for their own use or for a particular business model. But then thanks to our wonderful friends Google and uh, other organizations, you can do searches which can key into multiple data sets on the internet and you've got 192.com and the electoral register and social media and even those of us that appear at these conferences, our names appear on the IGF website and they get put into the search engines and you can actually find out an inordinate amount of information about someone from what, sure. what's been published on the internet. Um, scary enough if you know my email address from 1986 you can find things I posted on Usenet News in 1986 they are still sure. there um, and, and I suppose that we are going to continue having this problem that as more and more information becomes available on the internet and does not get removed and cannot be removed it's going to become more and more easy to track people and find people even if you don't know their name or mm. any information about them from that, we've actually shown how you can take someone driving a car, take their car yeah. registration number, and from that work out who they are, where they live, where their kids go to school, mm -hmm. where they work, and all of this just from basic information. Yeah. This is why the investment of the NSA is completely wasting money, because everything is already there. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want, I don't want to, to get too much in the substance in here. But just again as a methodological point, uh, I think it's interesting to see that a certain number of you have workshops regarding, so again, among the presentations, how many workshop organizers here are dealing in one way or the other with privacy related uh, issues or big data management? Can you, can you raise your hand? Okay, so my suggestion is the following. We have normally until four. I will take another 10 minutes so that we have 20 minutes, 25 minutes afterwards so that those of you who are doing those workshops, you get together in a corner in outside or whatever and see how you can piggyback on your different uh, meetings. It's, it's not an outcome that will have to be reported anywhere, but just to know who else is talking, whether you can have one speaker coming in and, and, and seeing whether there's a thread, and hopefully that there's not too much overlap between your different meetings. Um, we could try to do the same, the same thing uh, about the, uh, the other element, the cloud, the cross-border services, and so on, but I'm not sure it's absolutely necessary. Uh, I think we had one hour and a half. We're not, we're not obliged to use all, all time, but it's time for additional comments if, if you want. That's... that's what it's about, because we are going to have meetings after meetings after meetings during the whole week, so <laughs> I don't want to use every minute. Please. 
I'm here to listen to this, this privacy discussion, but I'm speaking at a session which is not on the topics for uh -huh. today, but which is very related, which is called Internet, Internet Governance and Open Government Data Initiatives. Uh, now, the yeah. op Open Government Data Initiatives are picking up on a lot of what has already been spoken relating to yeah. particularly to aggregation and, and metadata and um, privacy. So that's another area that is covering this, but from the other angle. Okay. So now, that's tomorrow at, at 11. At 11. Okay. So are there any other general comments on, on what we did at this pre-event in particular, uh, whether you think it's something that is useful to replicate next year or in a different format? Uh, no pressure. If you have no comments, we can, we can talk on another moment. Yes? I, I think it was a very good idea you're arranging this, but I also think uh, a meeting at the end uh, to say what have we all learnt from from from, the, from this, yeah. and how can we take it forward? Because the dynamic coalitions, frankly, don't really work very well. The ones that that we've been involved mm. in, so nothing is happening in between. So certainly we organise quite a lot of events I in between, but we don't necessarily tie up with other people from the UNIGF or, or yeah. get a concerted view from different parts of the world to put to different governments. So a suggestion would be to, to have something at the beginning like this pre-event and an equivalent at yes. the end to, to do a bridge and a stock taking? Let's do it. With this IGF? Yeah, why not? Well, does someone have um, the schedule? Yeah, um, it's very simple. Is there <laughs> when are when are the <laughs> workshops ending? When is the last workshop scheduled um, on day four? Uh, there's the closing ceremony and the open microphone session. There's one slot that is free in uh, you said we are hold three. Yeah, yeah, but the problem is that the open microphone session is also an element of feedback. So let's say, in, a, in as much as I would love to do it on the fly and, and organize it, I think the agenda of everybody is already very, very full during the week. Um, I think it's a tremendous idea, and we will definitely think about that uh, next year. As a matter of fact, I think it could be something that is organized as a portion of the uh, IGF itself, as a, as a structural element of the IGF. And I give that as a, as a hint for people who are in the mag and we may use this as a good suggestion. Uh, but, I'm, yeah, I'm, I think it's, it's useful. I think especially the point you raised of sharing events throughout yeah. the year because um, here, by coincidence, today we had a lot of people who are organizing privacy-related workshops. Oh. And as you said, they will organize a lot of events. <laughs> so knowing dates and, and basically where forums to discuss and address those issues take place is, I think, very important. Okay, with that, unless there are uh, additional comments or suggestions or, or feedbacks that you want to give, I think it's better to liberate a little bit of, of, of time. Uh, again, if people who are organizing the, at least workshops on, on privacy or others related to um, uh, cloud and, and so on want to group and discuss briefly just to coordinate or just exchange uh, names and coordinates to, to see how they can want to talk and work together. You're highly welcome. Uh, thank you so much for having come. It was really, uh, really great, and uh, I hope it was useful. If you want, we can give some of you uh, who may want it uh, some copies of the, um, of the guide, of the track guide, so that you can distribute it in your, uh, in your own workshop. Um, because it's, it's a way to, to look at different things. And for those of you who do not have a workshop that is overlapping exactly with ours tomorrow, um, you're highly welcome to come uh, at 11 on, uh, on room one, uh, knowing that there are others <laughs> at the same time, and we want, don't want to um, steal their thunder. Paul, any, any other comment? Uh, something I've forgotten? No, I think um, that's all. <laughs> Thank that's you very all. much. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. And enjoy the rest of the IGF and the afternoon.